Hello everyone, my name is Wouter Koster and I would like to talk to you about haplotype specific methylation in the human brain. I'm a postdoc bioinformatician in the lab of Rosa Rademakers in Antwerp at the VIB department of uh, molecular neurology. I would first like to start to thank my, my colleagues in the lab who contributed to this work. Without them, uh, this would not have been possible. And also the international collaborators who contributed samples and clinical diagnoses. And I would like to start my presentation with this quote from Sidney Brenner, one of the heroes of molecular genetics, which, which tells us that uh, progress depends on techniques first. And this is also where my work at the moment fits in. It's meta development and focusing on developing new techniques and nanopore sequencing is a great fit for that. My project focuses on frontotemporal dementia, which is a subtype of dementia, which is primarily characterized by language or behavioral impairments, in contrast to the more commonly known Alzheimer's disease, which has memory complaints. And frontotemporal dementia has a quite early onset when, when people are still active, uh, often before the age of 65, and is often confused with psychiatric disorders. The most frequently known cause of uh, frontotemporal dementia is a repeat expansion in CNANORF72 gene, which is also a candidate that has often been uh, sequenced on nanopore sequencing because it's so hard to detect with other technologies. And we don't specifically want to identify this variant, but we want to have the, the tools available to identify similar variants in other genes. Uh, with some help of Promethean sequencing, we've also identified a large nasty inversion in, in the DPP6 gene in uh, frontotemporal dementia. And similarly, in, in Alzheimer's disease, we have characterized a large VNTR expansion, which influences splicing and probably also methylation. And these examples are just to show that nanopore sequencing has a lot to offer for uh, neurodegenerative diseases. For this project, we will do Promethean genome sequencing on a, a rather large cohort of, of patients and controls. And when you're hearing this presentation, this should be done about 40%. We will look for structural variation and in also loci which are too repetitive for short read sequencing, we'll also look for small variants. And we'll also look for nucleotide modifications, which is the focus of my talk of today. And how is this going at the moment? So on this plot, you see per individual the yield that we obtain from one or multiple flow cells. And in the beginning, we had some optimization phase, testing extraction kits, and then we, we got started the sequence, which as, as usually uh, has some, some lower yields because there were some unforeseen circumstances. But at the moment, everything is going nicely and we often hit my internal goal of 80 gigabases or 25 volt coverage. And we also have to optimize uh, our, our shearing strategy because there is an, an inconvenient trade-off between the yield that you get and the, the sequencing length that you, you put in. And this simulation experiment with on the x-axis the, the read length and on the y-axis the accuracy, precision, and recall uh, told us that at a read length of 20 kb or 15 kb, there was not much more to gain when further increasing the read length, while we know that if we push the read length much higher, our yield will be uh, much lower. So that is for us the sweet spot between read length and yield. And this is also what we get out of this. As you can see, most of our reads are on uh, the 20 KB length. This plot is a logarithmic uh, transformation. So some are, are noticeably smaller because the DNA was already degraded to start from. So we mainly look for structural variants such as deletions, uh, duplications, and repeat expansions. But just like uh, normal sequencing for, for smaller variants, we'll find thousands of these structural variants uh, spread out across all of the genome. And it's rather difficult to figure out which one of these is actually pathogenic. And this is also a point where nucleotide modifications could play a role. If we see a structural variant associated with uh, a severe change in the methylation pattern, then this could be indicative that this structural variant is not just a harmless uh, bystander. Another great feature of nanopore sequencing is that we can face nucleotide modifications and uh, variants in parental haplotypes. So as you can see in this overview of reads, which is, is not of uh, work from us, but from people sequencing GBA, 
you, you can see that the nucleotide variants, the single nucleotide variants can be phased into haplotypes. So by looking at reads which overlap multiple of these variants, we can figure out which variants belong to the same paternal haplotype, which are either inherited from mom or either inherited from, from, the, pattern, from the dad. And nucleotide modifications in a, in a mammalian genome are mainly found in a CPG context, a C followed by a G, a denucleotide. And these Cs can have various metal uh, modifications with the most frequently uh, studied and most frequently found to be the metal cytosine. And on my wish list for uh, soon to be developed is models for the hydroxymethylation on Promethean, which is also a very relevant nucleotide modification in the brain. And the great feature about nanopore sequencing is that if you put unamplified DNA to your pore, then every covalent modification of these nucleotides will be immediately visible. And this is also the case for the cytosine methylation that I'll be talking about in the rest of my presentation. So how do I get to haplotype-specific methylation? I start with phasing reads into haplotypes. And this is a feature that is uh, from available in Longshot, the tool that we use for calling uh, single nucleotide variants. And then per CPG, per read, the methylation likelihood is determined using nanopolish. Although the same approach could also be used with alternative tools. Then we count the number of methylated and unmethylated CPGs per locus, which in my case, I use an ENCODE brain DNA's hypersensitivity loci annotation uh, data set from. But I, I would also be very much interested in changing this to go to a data-driven method for segmentation rather than an annotation based. But next is to test for a difference in the methylation frequency using Fisher exactness to compare uh, both haplotypes for the number of methylated and unmethylated CPGs. And if we do this for a bunch of samples, this looks like this, with about 1,500, slightly more, slightly less, um, haplotype-specific loci per individual. And those highlighted in red, about two to 300, are strictly sample-specific. So they're only seen once in this entire cohort. Of course, this approach might still need some tuning. But this is the picture where we are looking at at the moment. Uh, you can also see that there are some outliers here with notably lower uh, number and not the higher number, and it yet uh, remains to be investigated why these differences are, are there. Uh, looking at the principal component analysis, this shows us two notable outliers, which are presumably due to technical reasons. But at this moment, I can't really identify what's the cause. And I assume if we've sequenced more samples, that this might become clear. Repeating the PCA with, without the outliers shows you this. And the colors here represent different subgroups of, of patients, with green being healthy control individuals. And it, it's very good news that these are, are not uh, separated by a subtype. Because what I'm looking for here is not a, a large difference between patients and controls, but rather a discrete, specific locus uh, causing a difference between a subgroup of patients and the controls. In neurodegeneration, it's often a problem that you have a difference in cellular composition, that there is a profound neuronal loss, and at the same time, an upregulation of immune components. And that the differences that you see between a patient and a control brain are not necessarily primary to the disease, but rather secondary to the uh, differences in cellular composition. And this approach is also uh, quite safe against such effects because for every cell that we sequence, we have an internal control to the other haplotype. So every uh, individual is first compared with the other haplotype of itself before it's comparing patients versus controls. So the internal control here is, is quite powerful. Uh, for this purpose, I've also developed Matplotlib, which is a browser for, for nucleotide modifications. I got slapped by one of the reviewers when I called it a genome browser, but I still plan to extend this to, to a larger scale visualization. And it, it can incorporate data from multiple sources. I'm always open to add additional uh, nucleotide modification tools, but at the moment it supports nanopolish, nanocompore, uh, CUPI, and, and other methylation data in bed graph formats. Additionally, you can add GTF and PET annotation for genes and, and other intervals of interest. And I welcome all your contributions. I use various modules and, uh, from the, the Python data 
uh, ecosystem. And uh, I'm very happy to uh, get your help with, with getting what exactly what you want visualized in Metplotlib. Metplotlib has some plots for QC, which is maybe not the most exciting, but definitely one of the most important things that you can do with your data. And it shows more plots than what's here on my slide. But it, you, you can also see that the outliers can be detected here in, for example, the plot on the right. If you start comparing the frequency of, med of modifications or methylation uh, pairwise per sample. So you'll see here that, that sample 10 is poorly correlated with all others. And this turns out to be an outlier in this case. And very interestingly, if you have uh, imprinting, uh, if you have haplotype specific methylation going on in the locus where you make this plot of, you will see something like this in which some haplotypes are highly correlated to others, but others are then totally different. And this shows you which haplotypes correspond to another haplotype in the other sample. This is an example of the browser view. And on the top, you'll see the, the frequency of having, uh, having a modification, in this case, methylation. And this goes from, from zero to one, with zero being no modifications at all, and one, all of them are, are modified. And this also uh, corresponds to what you expect from biology, in which highly modified, uh, highly methylated loci can be found uh, in the gene body and inactive uh, intergenic uh, loci, while the more regulatory important parts, like promoters and uh, regulatory elements upstream of the gene, are often hypomethylated. And in the, the talking about these frequencies, we can also see that these are, are highly reproducible across samples. So you can see the same dips and tops across multiple individuals here, uh, all between zero and one, and also here corresponding nicely to the gene annotation. The bottom part here shows you the individual reads, color coded by the, the likelihood of having a modification at that position. Blue indicates that it's likely unmodified, probably just a normal cytosine. And the red indicates that it's likely modified. It's a most likely a methylated cytosine. And it shows here that it's also nicely reproducible. If you see a stack of all blue nucleotides, then it's uh, mostly corresponding to a, a low frequency of methylation. And here on the bottom, you see the, the annotation part with uh, the genes and the, the DNA's hypersensitivity loci. Looking at this for X chromosome silencing is also very interesting. This is a lymphoblast cell line in which all cells have the same chromosome uh, silenced and the same chromosome active. And we could think of these as, as one is the maternally inherited and the other one is the paternally inherited chromosome. Although we're not entirely sure which one is exactly maternal and which one is paternal, but we know that they're, that they're different. And this shows us that for one chromosome, the uh, promoter regions of these genes are highly methylated and thus inactive. This is an inactive X chromosome. And the other one shows a highly active X chromosome for these promoter regions. And we can just reveal this by the data itself. And this is a locus in which parental imprinting is a feature. And this one is, is particularly interesting because we can see here mutually exclusive methylation over a distance of several of 100 kbs. And the upper part, phase one, the blue part, will show you in that there is a loss of methylation, hypermethylation here at the beginning of the blue gene, while uh, the other gene, phase two, shows a uh, loss of methylation a bit more upstream, corresponding to the promoter of the other gene. So in this case, the antisense gene is active on the phase two chromosome, while the, the sense gene is active on the phase one chromosome. And also a bit further uh, upstream, we can see a difference between the, the methylation patterns. And this is a locus for which parental imprinting is, is a known feature, but at this resolution, you can only see this with, with nanopore sequencing. Looking at this with short bisulfite sequencing, we will figure out that there is indeed differences between the loci, but we will not be able to see that it's mutually exclusive. And it's potentially very powerful also in a disease context. And with that, I would like to, to finish my presentation uh, and 
I hope when we meet again in, in London or at a later date, that this work can shift from technique development to discoveries and new ideas. Thank you for your attention.